Hey everybody, welcome back to part five as I continue to react to uh, Extra History's Simon Bolivar. Uh, it's been an interesting ride, learning a lot about a guy that I really didn't know all that much about, uh, beyond the fact that he was known for helping to liberate uh, nations in South America from Spanish rule. Most of the rest I'm learning as we go. Hopefully you're learning some things along the way as well. If you haven't seen the first four parts of my reaction series, the link is in the description below, as well as the link to part five of the original video over on Extra Credits. Make sure you go over there and check out some of their content. They've got a lot of really good stuff on their channel. Uh, I want to do something a little different before we dive into part five today, because uh, for me and people that I care about deeply, uh, this is a uh, difficult day. It's April 20th, and I know for a lot of people, 420 means one thing, but for me and my friends, it means something very different. Uh, today is the 22nd anniversary of the uh, school shooting that happened at Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado on April 20th, 1999. Uh, the first uh, person who died that day was a 17-year-old girl named Rachel Joy Scott, who, uh, within a year or two of that shooting, had become one of my heroes. I learned a lot about her story by reading a book that her parents wrote about her life, um, named my daughter after her, my daughter who will be 16 in July. Uh, we named her Rachel Joy in honor of a girl who I never met, who I only learned about through books, through uh, TV, uh, through interviews that I saw with her family. Uh, but there was just something very special about her as a 17-year-old who was wise beyond her years, who uh, saw every single person that she met uh, through the eyes of compassion and made it her life's mission to go out of her way to show compassion and kindness to people. In fact, she wrote a quote that we share all the time uh, with Rachel's challenge, which is, compassion is the greatest form of love that humans have to offer. And she said, I have this theory that if one person would go out of their way to show compassion, that it would start a chain reaction of the same. She said, people will never know how far a little kindness can go. And that became her life. Her life was that if she showed com compassion and kindness to somebody, that person might do the same for someone else. And pretty soon you're impacting the world in ways you never could have imagined. And tens of millions of people who've uh, heard her story have had their lives impacted by it. And I've had the privilege uh, for the last eight years now to be a part of an organization called Rachel's Challenge where I get to travel around uh, the United States speaking in schools, sharing Rachel's story. Uh, as a way of honoring her, but more importantly, as a way of encouraging young people and adults to recognize the power of their words and their actions to have an impact on the lives of other people. So uh, on this 22nd anniversary of a tragedy that took the lives of 13 innocent people, uh, I, I just want to encourage you to, to look for opportunities today to show kindness and compassion to someone else in honor of Rachel and the 12 others who were murdered that day. Uh, I know I'm thinking of my uh, my friends who really are more than friends. They're family to me, the Scott family, uh, who I know this will be a very difficult day for them uh, and for all the other families as well. So uh, in honor of them, uh, go out and have a great day. Uh, go out and make a difference and be kind to people. Let's dive into this next part uh, of Simon Bolivar. With the liberation of Peru, a lifetime of labor had come to its fruition. The Spanish were, at last, pushed off the continent. Bolivar had conquered more territory than Napoleon, and he was hailed as El Libertador, from Lima to Bogota. When he looked about him, he saw a glorious army, cheering peoples and a world full of possibility. But he also saw a world devastated by years of brutal war. It would take much to turn the ashes of the Spanish Empire into the republic he had dreamed of in his youth. With the expulsion of the Spanish from Peru, Bolivar had thought his work would be done, but standing there in Lima, having just accepted the office of President of Peru, he finally had time to look up from the business of war and see just what a state the country was in. There were armies scattered throughout the nation, each with little loyalty but to whomever led it. There were other claimants to the presidency, and questions not only of his political legitimacy, but the legitimacy of the whole Peruvian Congress. So here's an interesting dilemma if you're Simon Bolivar at this point. Uh, you've done all of this, arguably, for the reason that you want to have self-governance, self-determination. You don't want to be ruled by a foreign power in Europe. But now, you know, if you're going to argue for freedom and you're going to argue for self-determination, don't you have to also then give the people a say in who they want to lead them? Just because you led uh, the revolution 
does not mean you automatic, automatically should get to lead the country. At least I'm sure that's how they're thinking. Uh, and maybe that's a very 21st century way of looking at it. Um, but it's an interesting dilemma for Simon Bolivar. The economy was in tatters. The social inequality between native peoples, slaves, mixed race peoples, and whites was a powder keg just waiting to tear the country apart. And to top it all off, here he was at the head of a foreign army having just liberated the country, but that liberation might start to look very much like something else if he did not quietly return home with his soldiers soon. Yep. But that was never Bolivar's way. He was gonna fix the whole thing. He had Congress confer upon him nearly dictatorial powers, but even with such powers, he was stymied at every- So let's just take a moment and recognize the Star Wars reference here. Obviously, this is meant to look like Emperor Palpatine with the lightning coming out of his fingers, and Congress gave him near dictatorial powers, and of course, that's all a parallel to uh, what happened in the 1930s in Germany uh, with the rise of, uh, of the party there. Every turn. He just didn't have a sense of the intense factions and loyalties that ran deep in Peruvian politics. He often lamented that he had never stepped foot into Peru. But at the same time, Peru was now part of his plan, part of his ambition for a great South American state, or at least a federation. If he was to achieve that, he had work to do. He immediately set out to reorganize the government, reform the treasury, reform the legal system, and rethink how education was provided. He took a whirlwind tour of the country, appointing everyone from the mayors to the local schoolmasters in many of the towns he visited. But it was never enough. Peru mm. was a royalist country, but more than that, its people were just worn out. Much of the zeal for revolution and for all of the new projects that would bring was carried only by the charisma of Bolivar. As soon as he would leave a town, it would slide back into its yep. torpor. His work and we talked about that in previous episodes. When it's built on your charisma, on your personality, the minute you're not there, whether that's physically or in terms of in life, uh, it's going to fall apart. And, and this guy's got his hand on everything. They're saying he's appointing the postmasters and the mayors. When he has that much power and that much influence, it's going to leave a major vacuum when he's gone. And he can't possibly rule that much territory effectively if he's doing everything down to that minute detail. He's got to have other people doing this stuff. Work undone. To his joy, he found that his old schoolmaster, the very man who had introduced him to many of the revolutionary ideas that shaped him, had returned from exile. Bolivar immediately put his old tutor in charge of the school system. But like so many that Bolivar appointed, he was not a man up to the task. He tried earnestly, he had the passion, but he didn't have the capacity to plan and organize. He had been a great one-on-one -on -one tutor, but when given the job of systemizing and marshalling the logistics for a whole nation's education, he was woefully out of his depth. And so it went across Peru. Mm. Progress and reforms were slow. But better news was coming from other quarters. Nations in Europe had begun to officially recognize his Republic of Gran Colombia, and Antonio José de Sucre, the young general he had sent to the separate province known as Upper Peru, had won some astounding victories and liberated the whole region. But Upper Peru, too, came with its own mm. questions. It and I'm wondering, too, what's going on in Gran Colombia during all this time? So Gran Colombia, I mean, you're talking the modern-day nations of Panama, Colombia, Venezuela, uh, primarily, but, um, you know, I'm wondering what's going on. If he's focusing all his time on Peru, what's going on back there? And is it doing okay? It was rich in silver, and so its sovereignty was hotly in dispute. Would it become part of the yet war-torn Argentina? Would it be put under the yoke of the newly liberated Peru? Or would it become a new nation unto itself? Well, when the local Congress declared that they would be an independent republic, Bolivar certainly didn't object. Maybe this was because the new rich republic could join the confederation he was putting together without all of the baggage that he saw coming with the rest of Peru. Maybe it was because they invited him to come and write their constitution. Hmm. Or maybe it was because they named their new nation Bolivar. Actually, that <laughs> might have been the reason. Of course, they did change Bolivia. the name to Bolivia a few days later, once somebody pointed out that, guys, Rome wasn't called Romulus, come on. Really, they should just call the place Bolivia or something. But the gesture was there, and Bolivar was, without a doubt, eager to write their constitution. And so the Congress declared him President of Bolivia, which is only a little awkward because he was technically already President of Gran Colombia and the President of Peru. But hey, why let your current job as the head of two different democratic states get in the way of a little constitution writing? Mm. And Bolivar really thought that this would be his legacy. He thought that this new constitution would solve all of the problems that he saw burning through Spanish America. 
He worked on it feverishly, and in some ways, it was all that you'd have expected from the idealistic young man who swore an oath to liberate his people on the hills outside of Rome. The Constitution abolished slavery, guaranteed Good. freedom of the press and freedom of movement. It established a legal system based upon trial by jury rather Good. than by magistrates. But there was one difference from what you might have expected out of a man enamored of the idea of liberty and of a free republic. His constitution also stipulated that the president would serve for life, mm. with the right to choose his own successor. So, you know, and, and before we start passing judgment on this, there was a strong movement for that in the United States as they were putting together a constitution. Alexander Hamilton, for example, was very much in favor of what would have been a monarchy in all but name um, for hereditary titles that would be passed down. Uh, so there was a strong movement for that in the United States as well, even though they were also pushing for democracy. So uh, I'm not going to pass too much judgment on him for this, but obviously in hindsight, it's easy to look back and say, how could you really be for freedom and self-determination if you're going to appoint a president for life who then gets to pick his own successor? But uh, obviously that didn't end up going well. Now, Bolivar said that he had put all sorts of checks in there to make sure that the president acted in good faith, but you can see why this president for life with hand-picked successor business sounded a little bit worrisome to people. Reactions to the constitutions were, shall we say, mixed. Very few people openly criticized it, but it was readily adopted only in Peru, where Bolivar and his army were actually located. Even in Bolivia, it was adopted only with reluctance, mm. and only when Sucre, the general who had liberated the region, agreed to hold the post of president, but then resign after two years. But all of this cost time. Precious, precious time. While Bolivar was hiking around Peru, while he was micromanaging towns, while he was pinning his bold constitution, other men had been serving as the heads of the various states that he'd liberated. Venezuela, the former territory of New Granada, Bolivia, Quito, which we now know as Ecuador, each had their own head of state, and as time passed, each became more entrenched. Mm. Each saw their own power grow, and each found reasons to see the others as rivals. Gran Colombia, the state which Bolivar was supposed to be running, the first state which he had been granted the presidency of, was tottering on the edge of financial collapse. The army which he'd been gallivanting around Peru with, it was funded from Gran Colombia. The vice president that he had left in charge of Gran Colombia had been sending him increasingly urgent letters about the fact that they were going to have to shrink the army or face ruin. And if you shrink the army, you can't enforce what you have in place. So here's a dilemma that there's no easy answer to. To make matters worse, Spanish America had never had the sense of oneness that the British colonies had. For centuries, they'd treated each other as rivals. They were as culturally different as the United States North and South. But the Spanish crown had kept them even more separated in terms of economic and infrastructural ties. The Grand Colombian experiment was the first time these nations had really tried to come together. And many in Grand Colombia felt that the experiment was going poorly. So cracks began to show. Mm. Caracas chafed at the rule of Bogota. Quito questioned its place in the Republic. Soon, stirrings began for a federated system. And all the while, Simon Bolivar's in Peru. So he's not even there dealing with this. He's dealing with this through letters. And this is the 1820s. And so it's not like uh, you're sending stuff uh, from one country to another that it's getting there instantly. It's probably taking a significant amount of time for all of this to unfold. More like the United States. Not the United States we know today, but rather the loose federation of states that served as the U.S. at its inception. The same federation that proved too weak to stand on its own, and eventually had to be made into a republic. But Bolivar knew that a federated state would never survive. That if there was no strong central authority to hold them together, these states would simply fall back into their national bickering, and, in the end, the whole project would be undone. And so he called a Congress, a meeting of the Americas, to work it all out. Join us next time to find hmm. out where that Congress leads us and where it leaves Bolivar. All right, interesting. So we can see what the problems are now. I'm wondering what this Congress is going to do uh, and, and where Bolivar plays into all of this because obviously it didn't work out because we know these are all separate nations today. So I'll be curious to know what went wrong with all of that. But let me know your thoughts about what we just talked about. If you have anything to add to what we uh, just watched, to what we just learned, uh, I'll be curious to know it. Use the comment section below. We'll be back tomorrow with part six. Thanks for watching.